we have a terrific group. And I guess the question, I suppose, if I put myself as a graduate student, incoming graduate student, that happened about 30 something years ago, coming into Stanford, um, they're all interested in perhaps the arguably the most you know, the defining challenge of the 21st century, which is energy and climate and the environment and national security. Um, given that, they're coming from different backgrounds. They're entering different schools, different departments. They'll be here anywhere from two to five or six years. In your own thinking, how should they approach their life at Stanford, the academic life, the professional life, their foundation in life for the future? How should they be looking at this? Because each school is different. And yet we are at Stanford where, the, as Stacy mentioned, mentioned, the walls are very porous. John, let me start with you. That's a, that's a narrow and <laughs> easy <laughs> question, Arun. <laughs> Um, so first of all, thanks. It's great to be here, and I'm delighted to see that we had 15 GSB students in this uh, in this group this year. It's fabulous. It just really shows the incredible enthusiasm and energy we have at the business school right now around uh, around climate and energy transition and and uh, and and sustainability broadly. Um, yeah, I you know I think that's a I think you you ask a great question about sort of just how to navigate your life at Stanford as a as a graduate student, and I think it does depend a lot on where you are in in some ways, and and of course the you know the first thing you have to do as a graduate student at Stanford is just establish your home base and wherever you are, and you know, at the business school you you come in and you're say in our MBA program, you you've got 420 people that you to get to meet, and that's takes a while to meet 420 other people in your class, let alone the people in the other classes. We have the MSX program. Some of them, you guys are here as well. You've already had a chance to be here for a couple of months. But um, I, you know, that I think finding your home community and establishing a base is really, really important. But I think what Stacy just said is also incredibly true. I mean, it is such an amazing thing at Stanford to be able to just walk across the campus and expose yourself to all different aspects of knowledge. and. The energy and environment is, is probably the, of all of the things you could think about at Stanford, it's probably the one that spreads out the most across the campus. And that is, on the one hand, actually incredible, makes it a little bit complicated to navigate because you're just going to see slide after slide with like 73 different things that you could get involved with. It's like a fire hose, and so it will take a while to figure that out. But as you start to to figure out what are some of the interesting opportunities, whether it's going over to the Earth School and taking classes on environment or engineering, learning about technology, or coming to the business school and learning about entrepreneurship and innovation, or going to a law school and learning about policy, that's a huge you know, opportunity. And I you know, encourage you to do it. And it, Stanford is a place with, as Stacy said, you know, it's very porous boundaries. That's, that's something we pride ourselves on. And um, you know, we try to be welcoming at the business school. We want all of you to come over and take some classes and get involved with with the things we're doing around sustainability and energy. And for those of you who are at the business school, you, you, know, you definitely want to see this part of campus as often as possible. So um, you know, I, I think uh, I, I just encourage you to take advantage of that. And, and you know, I'll just say one other thing about that, which is you know, we spend a lot of the time as the deans talking about initiatives that will span across the university. But the truth is, is that all of you, the students, are the glue that holds the university together because you're the ones who are going back and forth all the time. And so in some sense, you, you may not realize it, but you play a huge role at the university by you're the connective tissue between the schools. And so you know, we, we count on you in some sense to actually go ahead and do what we're suggesting that you do. Taking a word from particle physics, I think, I don't know if people have told you, you guys are the gluons, <laughs> glue in this campus. <laughs> Deborah, you're the, you're the dean of a very diverse and lots of departments, School of Humanities and Sciences. What is your perspective on this? So, uh, thanks. So, um, the School of Humanities and Sciences is 23 departments and 23 programs spanning uh, creative writing to uh, quantum <laughs> physics uh, in terms of the interests of people. So I would say, I mean, I want to echo what's been said about this is an amazing place because we have across the board at Stanford like phenomenal faculty. I mean, just phenomenal 
and they're all here on one physical campus, which is very unusual. A lot of places you have to you know, go off campus for the medical school or go off campus for the law school. Everything is right here. You can just you know, walk. You can play your uh, you know, um, <laughs> Luan role by walking through. The, the thing I would say is, I mean, you're gonna, you're so important to the future. I mean, the kind of research you're doing is so important to us. We want you to thrive here in thinking through, right, and, and contributing to thinking about energy issues. But I would encourage you to be, a, although you have to find your place and you, part of writing a dissertation, I think Stacy may have been um, uh, kind of, uh, I'm channeling her here, you know, is narrowing down. Every graduate student comes in with this huge ambitious project and undoable within a finite number of years and a finite number of pages. And we always push our graduate students to narrow. But start by thinking really broad and the thing that to me is very important is that energy is not just a technical question. It has lots of technical questions that we have to make progress on, but it involves political and ethical questions as well. And so I would encourage you to reach out across the campus and across H&S um, and take courses in policy you know, learn about like the history of water conflict in the West, or take a course in ethics in the environment, or take a course on legal regulation. Just be, be broad because you're gonna need to pull on vast numbers of tools, even if it's not what you specialize in, to attack the energy problems that we face. And this is a great place to do that. We are, um, you know, we're physically co-located the barriers are really low. All the deans and all the schools work closely together. We're interested in mounting joint courses and bringing faculty together and faculty and grad students across the schools. So take advantage of that. That's a really phenomenal thing about this place. Um, something I didn't appreciate, I was at MIT as a graduate student, and MIT is a great place, but it's very, very different, especially in my field, which was philosophy. There are only like four of us on the campus and one <laughs> undergraduate, so it was very different. But it was much more siloed than this place is, and I just think this is, you, know, you have an incredible opportunity here, and I... Um, I urge you to take it and look forward to seeing you in some humanities and sciences courses and working with some of our faculty. Cam, you were, the, you were a graduate student in physics out here, and yes. now you're the dean of research. That's right. So give us both perspective. Well, in some sense, I still feel like a graduate student in physics sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I really agree with the advice that Dean Levin gave to those of you who are working on the policy and business side to really stay deeply in touch with what's going on on the technology side. You know, obviously that, that interface and joint strengths is part of what makes us hopeful that Stanford will have a real impact on this incredibly difficult challenge. How many of you are working on the energy technology side from a science and engineering perspective primarily? How many of you are planning to do that? Raise your hands a little higher so I can see them. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. And of those of you, how many of you are in SIMES, the Stanford Institute for Materials and Energy Sciences, are in it or plan to be working in it? Okay, that's really interesting. Last year it was a lot higher number. I wonder what the shift is. Um, I'm actually a SIMES PI, so for the two of you, I look forward to seeing you there. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my own work has been in quantum materials, and I worked in quantum materials because I, I love physics. Quantum materials are a super exciting intellectual challenge. But I also chose that particular field of physics because when I was a physics graduate student, I was highly optimistic that we could discover new materials that would transform the, in, in, the uh, energy landscape and maybe also the information technology landscape. Um, I personally, uh, the reason why I'm an administrator now is because I felt like the problem has become so severe for the world um, and quantum materials has not yet produced those awesome high temperature superconducting cables. I felt like my, a, a good chunk of my time could be best spent creating an environment where all of you can do your best work. We really need you. 
So for the two thirds of the room who raised your hand that you're working on an energy technology, my advice to you would be yes. Get super fascinated by the work that you're doing. Become experts in your field. Go to conferences in your subfield. But also your brain and your time are a really incredible asset for the world. So it, it's really your responsibility to come to programs like this to make sure that you're aware of the broader energy and policy landscape so that you can make sure that you're putting those technical talents to where they're doing the, the where they have their best, highest use. So that's my primary advice for you. And then I also have a request for you. Um, as the Dean of Research, um, I uh, oversee a number of services for researchers, uh, parallel to the ones that uh, Professor Bent mentioned for graduate students. So if there's something that you need and it's missing, some help in technology transfer, entrepreneur training, whatever it is, please reach out to me and let me know because we're here to provide services that will make you be effective. Steve, School of Earth. Well, um, I think everything that's been said is very much to point. One of the great things about this place is that um, there are the opportunities for people to really dive deeply into specialization. And there's undoubtedly true that, um, that deep technical expertise is going to yield breakthroughs in technology, as Cam has already alluded to. At the same time, the university is built these days to take advantage of interdisciplinarity. And in fact, um, the fact that uh, Precord is, is hosting this event is a testimony to the fact that the university is open for business with regard to cutting, cutting across disciplinary boundaries. Um, and so do take advantage of that. Uh, I guess an additional thing I would say is that, and it's to a point that John made earlier, um, it can be difficult if you're sitting in the business school to try and see what's out there and navigate that. And a lot of it is done by word of mouth, your colleagues, the, the, the cohort you're developing here. But we've also done a lot in recent years to try and uh, lower some of the uh, barriers um, and have started to develop joint curricula of various kinds to take advantage of the fact that everybody knows that um, energy is a complicated systems problem. Um, and you have to look at it from many points of view. So as an example, there's an interdisciplinary graduate program cited in Stanford Earth, um, the School of Earth, Energy, and Environmental Sciences, called the Emmett Interdisciplinary Program on Energy and Resources. And that particular program offers the opportunity for someone in the business school to an M get an MBA and simultaneously get a master's degree in Stanford Earth uh, for those people who are interested, for instance, in the natural resource end of things. And that program offers joint degrees with all of the other schools as well. So there are a number of those kinds of opportunities that you may not know yet about that you would want to look into because they will afford you some uh, ability to um, diversify your portfolio in a way that actually builds credentials. Stacy, let me ask you a slightly different question. Sure. Um, and that is uh, on the, you know, you, you, you were the director of the um, Tomcat Center. You created in your tenure okay, one of the most impactful programs on the innovation transfer program, which we talked about yesterday. And in the context of our ecosystem around us, tell us a little bit about why you did that. Where do you want this to go in the future now that we are, you're handing over to a couple of fantastic people? And how could the students leverage um, that? So, uh, okay, yeah, wearing a different hat, which is the kind of former director of the Tomcat Center. So when we started that program, which was maybe five or six years ago, the reason we started this innovation transfer program, and have you had the panel yet, or is that later in the? I think that's later. Okay, okay, so you'll get to hear from some of the amazing teams that we funded and have gone off and started, you know, great ventures. But uh, we felt that there was a real absence of that here at the university. So amazing research, um, an amazing tradition actually of innovation and entrepreneurship, but not as much in the area of energy and sustainability. Some of those are really hard things to, um, to launch and get outside of the university. They're hardware intensive, they may have very long time frames. And so what we wanted to do in order to have the biggest impact for all this amazing discovery that was taking place at the research level is help facilitate the uh, way of externalizing that, getting that outside. Either the um, people within Stanford might decide they want to start something new commercially, or it could be picked up by industrial partners. Um, and so we started uh, 
sort of tentatively about six years ago, not knowing if there'd be interest and whether it'd be sustainable, speak of sustainable. Um, and we have since gone on to fund um, about 50 or 60 different teams. We've given out about $4 million in small budgets, so everyone gets a small amount, 50 or 100,000. It's a competitive process to get funding. It's teams with a faculty advisor. And, um, but those students have gone on to do amazing things with a little bit of seed funding. They've raised about uh, $200 million, and they now have um, revenue-bearing uh, companies. They hired 600 different people. They've, they've got a really great success story. Where I'd like to see that is, one, to have that continue. And what I'd really like to see is for that model to continue elsewhere. It doesn't only have to be at Stanford. In fact, that was one of the pushbacks we got when we first started the program. Why do you think all the good ideas are only going to come from Stanford? Of course we don't think that, right? <laughs> well, we might think that internally, but we would never say that out loud. <laughs> but uh, it, of course they're not all coming from Stanford. And we would love to see similar programs at other universities across the country. So that would, that's sort of the next step. I think it's still you know, a very much a thriving program. And I, I'm glad you'll get a chance to hear more about it. Brian Bartholomew, who will become lead the discussion later in the week, is the um, executive director. And he leads that program. Terrific. Um, I want you all to think about questions. We'll be opening it up. And in fact, I would rather have uh, you have this dialogue with, uh, with the deans over here. But before we go there, let me ask all of you, and in particular Steve, um, since you are leading this sustainability effort, there ha our campus, and this will be new to you, our campus has new leadership, new president, new provost, and many of the new leaders over here. And our campus has gone through something called the long range planning process to really set itself up for success for the next few decades. And out of that came um, a highlight, which is a focus on sustainability. And Dean Graham is sort of leading our campus effort on that. But let me just open it up to all of you to tell us a little bit about the long range planning process, what, actu you know, what were the outcomes of the broader outcomes, and then we can focus on the, su the sustainability part as well. Mr. Steve. <laughs> Well, uh, as Arun said, this has been a process that's been going on for a while now. It's coming to a head, and I anticipate that uh, uh, by around the end of the year, the president will make some big public statements about what the outcomes are. Uh, one of those, and the one that may concern uh, you folks more than uh, the others, is a sustainability initiative. And um, of course, Stanford has been deeply engaged in the issue of sustainability, including the energy component of sustainability for well over a decade. In fact, one of the outcomes of the last such big uh, uh, push um, uh, over a decade ago was the creation of the Precord Institute and the Woods Institute for the Environment. Uh, and those two institutes have done amazing things. In fact, you sitting here is an example of that, to lay down the foundation for what the next step is in terms of Stanford and sustainability. And all of you have seen all the headlines this summer of all the amazing and terrifying things that are happening with regard to climate change and other, as other aspects of, uh, of climate change that are impacting uh, people at a fundamental level. Uh, the time is now for us to act urgently, and Stanford intends to be at the forefront in trying to push forward to the next um, phases of not only the technology of sustainability, but also the full integration to, for instance, uh, 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 finance and uh, social impact as well. Uh, so uh, you are fortunately here just at the right time to see this come to fruition. And I expect that, uh, again, by the end of the year, you'll hear some big announcements about what we will do in sustainability. Certainly, it will include some initiatives that uh, are geared towards uh, uh, improving technological approaches, but we expect it to also include um, strong ties over to, for instance, people in Deborah's school, um, the ethics of sustainability issues, climate change, and certainly you can't do this without thinking about how all this has to be funded, and that's where we'll be interacting strongly with people in the graduate school of business. I'll add, I, I really agree with everything that Steve said, and I think the one thing that's really clear from the long range planning is how much community energy there is around this particular topic. Um, the Area Steering Group on Research reviewed a couple thousand proposals 
And if you look at where there are huge amounts of energy across the entire campus and all seven schools and in the independent academic units like Precourt and Woods and Symes, there are sort of two topics that everybody's deeply interested in. One of them is data. Everybody's very interested in data. And the other one, frankly, is sustainability. People uh, across the entire campus, you know, from the School of Medicine to the School of Education to the School of Law, um, who aren't represented here today to speak for themselves, everyone feels like this is hugely important. Um, and of course, there's also a lot of great work going on up at SLAC, which none of us have talked about yet. Right. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Um, Broadly, on, on the long-range planning, and you know, our president has, has said that you know, Stanford is a purposeful university. So any thoughts on, on just the broader aspect of the long-range planning and where we're going? Deborah? So, I mean, there's a kind of overarching theme of s at least part of the long-range plan, which is trying to remove the barriers to getting research out into the public. So a kind of... Um, we have a bunch of accelerator projects that are trying to accelerate the research our faculty and graduate students and postdocs are doing and bring it out to the world. So we have an innovative medicines accelerator that's trying to remove some of the barriers to the development of new medicines. We have a social problem solving uh, kind of accelerator to think about how do you tackle major social problems in partnership with uh, NGOs and government and for-profit companies, you know, to get the work out. We have a public humanities project to take the work of our humanities faculty and get it out to the public. So I think one of the kind of key pieces of the long-range plan is how do we accelerate the development of research and how do we accelerate the development um, of impact in the world? And obviously, the sustainability initiative fits completely in that. So does the social problem solving initiative. We've got a data science initiative similarly focused and a, um, a human centered artificial intelligence. Um, and I think that fits with the purposeful because although I actually believe in knowledge for knowledge's sake, and I don't want to say there are non instrumental reasons to care about being an educated person. It's also true that we have a responsibility, you have a responsibility um, to share uh, your research with a broader public for social good, so. Yeah. Sure, I'll, I'll just pick up on one thing that Deborah said, which is, you know, years ago, I, after I was an undergraduate here, I was a student at Oxford University in England. And some of you may have been to see places like Oxford or Cambridge in the UK, which were the original universities. Everything there was built with walls around it, all of the colleges. And the walls were built to protect the people inside the university from the townspeople, but also to protect the townspeople from the people inside the university. <laughs> and when universities came to the United States, they were, you know, they were modeled on those same universities from Europe with that same idea of protecting the university as an institution from the world in, and setting it apart. And Stanford was just built in a different way. That goes back to the founding of the university and particularly to the way it grew up in the 1950s and 60s as a national and then global institution. That was part of the way it was built as a university was to be, Stacy said, it was, we were porous between the schools, but we're also porous with the outside world. And that was, that's just, it's just built into the way Stanford is. And I think part of the long range planning process has just been thinking about if that's part of the, by design of Stanford as an institution, then what are the biggest problems and opportunities in the world that, as an institution, we should be thinking about? And the Lawrence Point has basically has identified four or five, I don't know that we've actually nailed down whether it's four or five, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know, key areas. And, and they're basically what you would expect. They're the, the, they're, the, they're the biggest challenges or opportunities in the world. They're the biomedical revolution. They're the rise of data and artificial intelligence, climate and sustainability. And the, and the general problem of taking, uh, finding solutions to all kinds of social problems and inequities that are, are you know, uh, problematic in our society and around the world. And thinking about how, as a combined institution across the schools, we can, you know, with our research and with our education, um, be productive, 
contributors to the to the world, and and that's you know I think you're going to get to be here at an exciting time because that process has been going on for two years, and now this year we're just last spring we started to we launched the first major institute on AI that came out of Long Range Plan, but I think over the course of the next year or two we'll be launching a whole bunch of new university wide institutes and initiatives, and so you're you're going to get to be here at I think a really exciting time for Stanford. Stacy. I want to um, just say something a little bit uh, historical about the long range plan because I think it gives some insight into how Stanford's philosophy maybe differs from a lot of other institutions. So you probably aren't familiar with it because it started two years ago, but the way the long range plan process was run here was it was um, open to the entire Stanford community. Students, staff, faculty were given the opportunity over a course of a couple months to submit proposals and we got thousands of proposals. This was the 2,000 proposals that Cam was referring to. And what you're hearing about now is a, literally a distillation through many different teams took those thousands of proposals, picked which ones you know, resonated or, or had the most support or really um, took advantage of Stanford's unique strengths. And in areas of education, research, our community, um, and this is what you're hearing. So it, it, the, the point is Stanford is really a bottom-up type of place. You have the opportunity here as students to influence what Stanford does as well. You don't all need to do that, of course. But many of the things we're talking about, the programs, the initiatives, originated from students, especially interdisciplinary ones, who, who really started something new back when they were students here and said, I want to you know, work between these faculty and these schools. And then those things grow over time. And then they really become big initiatives of the university. Cam, you have. I did. I wanted to add one more aspect of the long range planning outcome, which I think is more of an internal thing, so it won't maybe feature as much in big pub public announcements. But I think one decision that we collectively made at the university is that wherever it's feasible and reasonable, we want to make our resources shared resources instead of resources that are captured by an individual researcher or an individual PI. Sometimes, I mean, I'm a low temperature physicist. I don't want anyone else soldering the wires on my cryostat. You know, there are some things that really do need to be controlled by a single group. But for research computation, data services, nano facilities, imaging facilities, maker spaces, and other life science uh, facing facilities, um, there's really, I think, a great opportunity. To, we do a pretty good job already, but a great opportunity to do an even better job of setting up those capabilities in such a way that there is no structural barrier to anybody in this room so that you could just access all of those facilities um, just by signing up for them. And so then your research can really be driven uh, by you without needing to wait for your PI to talk to another PI to see if you can have access to that wire monitor. So it's another homework assignment I'd like to give you to when you go back and plan out your, res your research, think about what are the things in those categories that you need. If there's a data set that you'd like us to have a subscription to, right, or there's a kind of spectrometer that would really help you that's not available, think about that. Uh, again, you can let me know about it directly. Make sure whatever PIs you're working with know about it and get that fed into the hopper of possible priorities for acquisition. And maybe some of those things can be here in time to help you with your research. Terrific. We have half an hour left. We are halfway through. And let's open it up for questions. And I know the first question is always the largest barrier, but we have a first one over there. Sure. And <laughs> yeah, the mics, yeah. Uh, hello. So Just identify, name yourself and say your name. Uh, and do I have to school. stand up? Do I have to stand up? No, you don't have to stand <laughs> up. You can sit down. So, uh, my name is Albo, and I'm from aerospace. Uh, and I wanted to ask you this. So you've been speaking about uh, long-range planning. So uh, how, how much exactly does it see in the future? Is it one year, five, ten years? And how confident are you in this uh, prediction? Anyone wants to? Well, I think the, the university-wide initiatives that we've been talking about are things that we think will be essential activities for Stanford for the foreseeable future. I, uh, I don't think that we see uh, data science and AI or the biomedical revolution or climate change and sustainability or the need to do foundational research. N none of those are things that are going to change in the near future. So identifying those big topics and thinking about what are the main things that we want to achieve in those topics. 
What, what kind of work can we do that will accelerate research to impact? And what resources do we need to do that? The, the details of it will change as we go along, but I think we feel pretty confident that those are important topics for a while. Could I add something? So uh, in this process, we've been asked to think about 20 years out, um, sort of to the long view, as Cam has talked about. But we're also trying to identify and prioritize things that we can do very quickly that will have a, a short-term uh, but really impactful outcomes as well. So we're thinking about sort of the whole range of time scales involved here. Yeah. Question? Over here. Hi, uh, my name is Akwesi. Um, I'm from the electrical engineering department. Uh, I had a question with regards to the business classes. Um, for an engineer that wanted to start learning about like the entrepreneurial side of the energy field, uh, do you think that it's there are a, a number of prerequisites that they'd have to do in order to get into the classes, or um, is it just more like many of the classes could be stuff that you can come in without really experience in business and entrepreneur stuff? Um, I think the most important thing is an open mind and a good attitude, and that'll get you a long way. Okay. So the, we have a whole range of different classes around entrepreneurship, and they, some of them are, uh, are classes that are focused on managing and leading organizations. So they're, they're sort of heavily focused on the management and, and, and leadership side. And you can in, sign up for those out of, en, out of engineering. They build to some extent on our core curriculum, but then they, you, you, you can have entry. And then a lot of them are experiential classes. They're just classes we're going to work in teams on projects, and you're going to build a business plan, try to build out a business model. In fact, some of them end up later with, with Stacy as, as uh, you know, ventures with the ones in energy. And, um, and those, actually, we love having engineers in those classes. Because it's an opportunity then to create teams that where you put together business students with engineering students who might have technical expertise in an area. And actually, some of the most interesting projects we get end up being interdisciplinary projects where you have a, you know, you have a, both someone who's people who are expert on the business model and thinking about how to build out a business plan and think about the customers and people who have a really good technical foundation so they can think about the you know, underlying product. And you know, we've had many great collaborative companies come out of business school classes. Okay. So yes, we want to see you, all of you. <laughs> Startup Garage is probably the biggest of our experiential classes, oh, okay. which is a class that we have about 300 students a year go through that class. All right. Thank you. Questions? Comments? Yep. Uh, hi, my name is Nathaniel. I'm from the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh, I've heard a lot of positive. Oh, thank you. My name is Nathaniel. I'm from Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh, I've heard a lot of positive encouragement of graduate students getting uh, involved in research, and, and I've heard of a lot of different resources, Pre-Court Institute, SIMES, VPGE, uh, Bits and Watts Initiative. All these places have their own websites. Where's a good starting point, and is there a formal application process? Is it just a, a cold call to a professor? Is it an email to the institute itself? Uh, where do we start to get involved in, in research? A Google map for energy at Stanford. That's a good idea. Any thoughts? I, I can start answering that. I think in terms of um, research inquiries, you really have to reach out to the specific faculty member. You can get information on all the various websites we're talking about. You can find out who is doing the research. But um, we, we are not a top-down organization. Nobody at the Institute's going to be able to assign a student to a faculty member. It's going to have to be done between the, the research group and then the student. I just want to echo that comment that, and uh, something that Stacy said before is, this is a truly bottom-up place. You may be in civil and environmental engineering, but you could have a co-advisor in another department. I'm in mechanical engineering. I'm co-advising two chemical engineers in my group who sit in my group meetings, and one from physics. Mm -hmm. So this is, I mean, it, you could have as many co-advisors. In fact, the whole idea of things like a Bits and Watts initiative is to bring faculty with different expertise together so that the student who's part of that team gets the benefit of multiple advisors and their expertise. And they, when they, by the time they leave, they are you know, well-rounded in their, in their education and research. So that's the whole idea. Yes? 
So I want to um, slight, uh, uh, express a slightly more pessimistic view about the bottom-upness. We're also an incredibly decentralized <laughs> university, and that has a lot of great things, but it does make it challenging to get information. You know, we're trying to do better at having websites. Um, so Stacy had mentioned like the energy websites that try to help people pool. But it is, you've got to, like, it's, n it's not so easy sometimes to find the appropriate place. I agree the advisor is a good place to start, but you've sometimes got to reach beyond an advisor to really have um, a sense of what's going on, because your advisor might not even know all the things that are going on that are relevant. So there's a challenge here. We're trying to do better at um, you know, re respecting the good parts of the decentralization and the bottom up, but helping people navigate it better. So I think it, it will be somewhat challenging. It's a work in progress. To, it's good to point. that point, uh, being well aware of the, of the challenges that you know, particularly you as a new graduate student face and trying to navigate the landscape of energy and sustainability. One of the outcomes of the sustainability initiative, uh, we hope, will be uh, a recognition of the fact that there needs to be some sort of centralization, at least of information, so that you can, in fact, get past that problem. It's part of the reason we're having it, this <laughs> <laughs> energy Stanford Slack. Yep. Hi there, I'm Chris from Chemistry. Uh, one of the things I've gathered about the difference between undergrad and graduate school is many of these degrees you're expected to focus very narrowly and you're intended to get a degree of expertise in an area. How do you recommend both maintaining this breadth while being in a program that, so for instance, my program, um, it's encouraged not to take very many classes. You're supposed to be in the lab. How do you recommend both staying broad while in a program that's intended to make you focus narrowly on a subject? I would say classes are great, but seminars are also great. You don't have to be enrolled in a three-unit class that requires you to do 10 hours or more of, of work every week in order to really get the benefit of being at Stanford. So I think take a lot of advantage of seminars and of conversations with different people. And also, within the chemistry department, um, you can look for a PI in a research group that's supportive of your desire to educate yourself broadly and will be supportive of your taking key energy classes. And since I know a lot of the chemistry faculty, I know that there are some that will be supportive of that. So I would think of yourself as an asset and put yourself where you can best flower. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Uh, I completely agree with that. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it, it is a challenge because graduate school is about honing and narrowing and becoming an absolutely deep expert in an area. Um, unlike in undergraduate, we want some depth in our undergraduates, but it's not a full-scale immersion the way it is in a PhD program. But at the same time, lots of the faculty are connected to people outside their department and to other areas, and lots of the issues that people work on have other aspects that are relevant to being deep. And so I would say, you know, try to find out where those are, take advantage, find a faculty member or a group of faculty members who are supportive. But I don't advisors know who love students who are both deep and broad. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I don't know who your advisor is, but you might want to just suggest that in your group meetings you invite people from other groups mm -hmm. to come and give a research talk, and that becomes like a class then. It's like a tutorial mm -hmm. of a different subject. We do that all the time. Great so that way you broaden yourself. Even though you may be sitting in a group, suddenly you get someone from a different field coming and giving a seminar. It's a new topic, but you learn. And that's the whole idea of broadening yourself to the research meetings. Yeah. Please. Hello, my name's Jordan. I'm with the business school. Uh, <laughs> I like the self-identification there. It's good. You know, it's, uh, I decided to hype up the business school today in, in anticipation for this talk. Uh, I, one of the reasons I came to the business school, I previously worked in politics, but I really wanted to gain some technical training on how to operationalize big, impactful ideas. Um, and one of the things that has been mentioned multiple times is this effort to accelerate ideas to impact, and which is fascinating to me. So my, my question is twofold. One is, uh, what do you see as the biggest impact, or the biggest obstacle to accelerating those ideas to impact? Because I feel like a lot of times we just have many, many brilliant people thinking up great ideas, and so many of them never actually make it into the public. 
Uh, and the second would be more personal, which is for somebody like me who's a new MBA student, what would be your biggest, your single best piece of advice for how to engage with that process? You know, so the obstacles differ, I think, in different areas. We know that in the innovative medicines, there are, you know, you hit a block of trying to scale up and get the pharmaceutical companies. There, there are blocks, so they're trying to figure out how to, you know, jump over those blocks. In the social science realm, I would say sometimes the problem is that the relevant communities are not partners in the room. And uh, so they're not co-creating the knowledge or shaping the knowledge. So that's one of the things we're looking to do is to create some labs um, in the social sciences that'll involve partnerships with, let's say, cities around social problems. The cities will be brought into the room. They'll be co-creating the research. We'll test it and, and then scale it with the cities. Um, but I think the obstacles vary, and sometimes they're legal obstacles. So we're also trying to create infrastructure to help people with their, um, you know, memorandums of understanding, so that you know faculty don't know how to do that. I mean, a lot of faculty, and a lot of graduate students, I would say, don't know how to write for a public audience. And you know, of course, part of what you're trained to do is to write, you know, for peers and peer review and publish in the top journals. And that's all super, super important. But there's another aspect. We know that science communication is really, really important. And we haven't been doing as good a job as we should be. And so I think th we're trying to think about ways to help our faculty be better at getting their ideas out into the public in a way that can be part of the public conversation. Deborah, you mentioned earlier something very important that came out of the long range planning is the accelerator. Um, can students get involved in that? And if so, how? So um, all of these things are in process. Yes. But um, I think graduate students definitely can get involved. Um, the the um, impact labs are just being set up. They'll have faculty um, PIs, but they'll certainly involve graduate students. We have an immigration policy lab that's very successful, and that involves a bunch of graduate student um, graduate student co-workers on the project. So I think that'll all be coming out of the long range plan. It's still we're still launching, um, and so we're still um, it's all a work in progress. But this year, hopefully by the end of this year, a lot of these things will be launched. Jordan, are you interested in impact in a particular area or more generally in the whole process of acceleration to impact? A lot, but sustainability and energy in particular. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sustainability yeah. and energy? Yeah. So you asked what's the first thing a graduate student would do. I would say try to find a mechanism within the business school maybe to get academic credit for something, and if not, do it anyway. <laughs> get a group of other people together from the business school and maybe the law school to do a <laughs> survey of what do we most need to do in sustainability and what are their barriers to impact, and then come back and report to this group in six months. I think that would be an amazing You got a homework now. You got yeah. homework. Yeah, there you go. I think it's kind of a, a, a club or a practicum um, that looks at this issue could be tremendously helpful. And to your specific interests, uh, School of Earth is open for business, so. <laughs> yeah. I, I just echo, I love Cam, I think Cam's idea is fantastic. That'd be a great starting point. I, I, th I do think the, you know, from the programs that we have at the business school, I would say that the, it, many of the challenges we see for students who want to do impact-oriented work, whether it's you know, in energy or environment or in other areas, the, the, I, would, I think one of the big challenges is scaling. So a lot of students want to come in and they want to start on, a very, on the entrepreneurial level. And then the challenge is just how do you get a flywheel that will, you're, you know, you can think of an idea that, that, has a, that can be fabulously impactful at a local, small level, and how do, you, how do you think about a business model that will scale or something that will take off? The, I think we'd say the other category is to come in at the other level and to think about you know, how do you make change at a level that where there already is scale with large organizations or with government. And there the challenge is typically more political. It's how do you reorient or how do you get an idea to sort of catch hold in, in a larger setting. And you know, 
those are both great ways to come at the problem. And I think it's just a, you know, but there's, there's sort of specific challenges in, 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 in either way. And I think if you look around at faculty, for example, at Stanford who are working in these accelerators, they're actually, they come from both of those directions. Some of the initiatives are around policy impact and how do you, how do you work through large organizations, institutions to have an impact on, say, climate or sustainability. And the other direction, which is how do you come from bottoms up innovation? And you have, you know, you can try thinking from both those directions. But I think, Cam, actually, that's a great way to think about it, which is yeah, just yeah. go out and do your own survey and, and come up with your own answer. And this group would probably love to hear it when you, when you have it. Uh, this is Massimo um, from Italy, electrical engineer. Very simple question. You mentioned some projects um, that come uh, from Stanford uh, on the energy and sustainability field that uh, they say went out and uh, uh, were successful. Could you give some example of actual what they did in order to reduce emission or make more clean energy? You know, like what they have done. Do, do you have any example? I can give. Uh, How much time do you have? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Stacey. You, you'll hear more about this actually later in the week. But I could. I mean, some of our earlier. Uh, teams that we funded that have now been in business for about five years. One was on um, uh, using uh, sort of uh, satellite imagery and um, computer uh, automation to figure out where to place solar cells on rooftops. Uh, there was another one also doing really well on how to use uh, machine learning to uh, uh, discover materials. So they're, they're working with lots of different applications, uh, many in sustainability. So materials for, say, solar cells, rather than going and synthesizing all of them, they can um, scour the literature and use machine learning to figure out what you know, the next best material is going to be. So those are just examples of a, of a couple of them. But it's broad ranging. Like I said, we've had about 50 different um, teams. Um, some of them are related to energy efficiency, how do you, um, just like smart um, outlets that will help you figure out when to turn off and on uh, devices that are already being deployed in some of the stadiums in the area, for example. One of the companies that I'm, that came out of that's being funded by the Tomcat <laughs> Center is, I, I, in fact, I'm advising them, helping them, is to use drones mm -hmm. to go along transmission lines and distribution network to find where the trees are and where the fire hazards are. Because uh, you, you've just arrived at California, I'm assuming, but California had a major problem with fires and the electricity network. And so this is, and they are right in the middle. And they had planned it long back before the fires happened, but they are subtly very much in demand at this point. So this is another example. And there are many such, as Stacy said, you'll be hearing about that later. Questions? Any other comments, questions? Yep. Hi, uh, my name is Bowen, and I'm starting my master's in civil and environmental engineering. Uh, my program will be um, sustainable design and construction. Um, anyway, so uh, I recently learned that the Precourt Energy Efficiency Center closed down. Uh, is anyone like an expert in Precourt? Um, but anyway, so I am interested in the building energy efficiency like, projects. I was wondering, because the um, efficiency, energy efficiency center closed down, if the projects won't be available anymore, or are there any like, more ways you can still get involved in by, I don't know, some ways? I guess the question is for me to answer. Okay. Um, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. The, the center has closed down, but the activity, the research activity is going on. You should uh, talk to uh, Martin Fisher. Um, Rishi Jain and a few other people and get into that network of faculty looking at energy efficiency and I'm sure they'll be happy to work with you. Uh, Steve Comello, who is in the business school, is, is teaching, co-teaching a course uh, with Diane Grunick on energy efficiency, policy and technology. So many opportunities. Yeah, so we can chat later on. Okay, sure. Any other questions, comments? Well, hi, I'm Jerry. Well, I'm from Material Science and Engineering program, and now I'm a master, I mean, my master 
program. And I think uh, some of our students, like me, would have an have a idea of continue pursuing a PhD program. So do, do you have any <laughs> advice for us, who, for students now in a master uh, program and then would like to continue for a PhD program? Because maybe for students like us, we we'll think that uh, a research uh, experience would be incredible, important. But may maybe for our two years in Master of Science program, and we have to spend a lot of effort on research. Is this, uh, is this right for us, or maybe? Do, do you have any idea? It, it, I you said you're in materials. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Like materials I'm interested. Yeah. I'm a, Potentially, yeah. Uh -huh. It's very program specific. It's going to depend on exactly what program you're in, whether there are routes you know, that are already in place for master's students to consider petitioning for the PhD program. It's also very program specific whether there are going to be research opportunities for master's students. Mm -hmm. But that comes back to an earlier question. Um, if you're a master's student and you say, you know, I'm here for the master's, I didn't think about doing research, but now I want to try it out, that's generally a one-to-one -one discussion with a faculty member to find a faculty member who um, has an opening and, and you're enthusiastic about that research program. So there are routes, but it will, be, it will depend very much on, on your program. Let me, let me get personal <laughs> with all of you. <laughs> <laughs> At one point in your career, you were graduate students. You were, imagine yourself entering graduate school. And you have all had very successful and diverse careers. You've got a diversity that is you know, on parallel. Going back, and if you were that person entering graduate school now, what would you be telling yourself about how to plan your career in the future, how to plan graduate school moving forward? What would you be telling yourself when you were 20-something years old? Cam, you want to start? You're thinking about it, I know. Yeah. Or you want to go later? Well, no, I, I already gave, I think, some of my advice earlier. But I guess I think the most important thing is to think of yourself as the author of your own career and your own trajectory and your own growth. And think about what you need. Don't just look around and see what everybody else is doing and what other people who have been successful are doing. You know, really think about what your goals are, what you can do to make sure that your research is the most effective that it can be, why you're doing that research, what you want to do after you do that research, how that research fits into the larger context of knowledge in your field. You know, you should take ownership of that. I think the number one mistake that most graduate students make is they kind of just assume that the other people around them know what they're doing, right? And they do to some extent. But they don't know what's right for you to do as well as you can figure out what's right for you to do. That's my primary piece of advice. Deborah? Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Um, under, you know, being a graduate student is really different than being an undergrad because you are writing your own life here. I mean, undergrad, you make some choices, but a lot of things are already structured for you. Here, you've got to decide for yourself what is the orienting project um, that's going to be meaningful to you. And that's actually something nobody can do for you. You've got to do it yourself, but you can get help. And so I think the other thing about being the author of your own life is, but don't think you have to do it totally alone. You've got BPGE, you've got departments, you've got advisors, you've got resources here that are, we're all, um, committed, enthusiastic about your succeeding and thriving here. So the other piece of advice I'd give is don't be afraid to ask people for help, advice, information. Not that they can answer the, you know, the ultimate question about what you should like, write your thesis on or what you should do with your life or what, you know, whether you should go into an academic career or a non-academic. Those are questions you have to answer for yourself. But people are here to help deliberate with you and provide information and provide resources so you make the best decision you can. And I just say to that point, be proactive. Mm -hmm. Don't wait for things to come to you. Uh, this place has millions of opportunities available to you. Um, but they aren't necessarily going to come and knock on your door. So go after them. Uh, ask questions, as was just said. 
um, that will yield tremendous benefits to you. Stacy? I'm going to get a little more personal <laughs> back to Arun's um, question and, and say that I was actually, I think, the counter example of everything we're telling you to do now, <laughs> which is interdisciplinary, see what's out there. I was unbelievably narrow as a PhD student in chemistry to the point of the chemistry <laughs> question. I took my minimum six classes, and I was just in the lab doing my research. And I took advantage of none of these things we're telling you to do. And I guess I'm proof that you don't have to be broad and interdisciplinary as a graduate student to still go on and do interesting things. But were I to do it differently, I probably would open my eyes a little bit more than I did and look around and take advantage of other things. What, what I thought interdisciplinary was when I was a PhD student in chemistry was taking a physics class or a double E. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly didn't take anything in economics or <laughs> policy or anything like that. Um, I was just really deeply interested in the science and the scientific question that I was trying to answer. And it, it had some application, but it seemed you know, just the type of thing you might write to a funding agency. Now I'm all about the application. My career has completely turned, and I probably would have served myself better having done a little bit more looking out. But you can still be successful. I don't want everybody to think you have to do all of the things we're talking about. There is a place for every one of your trajectories here at Stanford. Some of you just want to get really deep into a research area if you're in the PhD program, and other ones really want to learn many different things. Um, well, I was in a PhD program in economics in, in graduate school. And so I, I actually, I've, I've often wondered what it was I would tell myself if I was starting again. And I, I'm actually not totally sure. Not, if I had been myself again, I probably wouldn't have listened. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think the, for me, the thing about, that I found about graduate school was it was the, I, I was in a PhD program at MIT for three years. It, I n never had a period in my life when I learned more. I just, it was like I was just absorbing so much information. And I, I hadn't really done economics before that. It was, it was incredible just as an intellectual experience. It was also just incredibly hard and isolating. And I was depressed like half the time. And, and in retrospect, I was doing well. But I didn't feel that way at the time. I just looked around, and everyone seemed like they had figured it out. And um, I felt like I was flailing, and I had no idea what I was going to write my dissertation on, or if it was going to work out, or if I was going to get a job. And that was really, really tough. And I guess I wish someone had just sort of said something to me at the beginning, like, don't worry. Everyone feels this way and when they're doing a PhD program. And it works out for almost all of them. And um, uh, that's, you know, that wasn't really the way, the way I, I, I I felt in grad school. And that was true, you know, by the way, even though I had, it was a great, wonderful environment and I had lots of people and friends around. It was just, it's just, it's so individualistic that when you, if you for those of you who are going to get into, you know, doing your own research as a PhD student, it's, it's really, it's, it's tense, it's very individualistic. It's like you have, it has to be, you have to deliver basically. And that's, that's really hard. And so I think just trying to, just remember that everyone around you is also going through that, even if they're not um, you know, saying it. That, that, that probably would have helped, helped me in, as a PhD student. Great. Yeah. Well, these are very, very, very busy people. And they bring, they brought so much diversity and, and depth in the discussion. Let's give them a big round of applause <laughs> for the time out here. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for...